Okay, mechanical keyboards. I'm done. See you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, so I didn't finish this part of the presentation, the introduction, um, mostly because as I was writing it, I was like, "What do I talk about? How about my love of keyboards?" It's kind of a more recent love. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I started getting into the hobby. Uh, before that, I wasn't. I mean, I, I knew what a mechanical keyboard was. You know, I liked it. I just didn't love it. But, you know, it just got too loud, too annoying. Like, who the heck? Who would want that? Mm -hmm. So then I started researching the hobby, and I really liked it. So, um, so for the past few years, I've been researching and looking up mechanical keyboards, seeing what the varieties are available, and I really wanted to make my own. My coworker made his own. He, he actually made a little bit of like a number pad type thing, uh, and I did something similar. Uh, just a really tiny macro pad, something he, he used uh, uh, SolidWorks a lot at work, so he needed something to just do some shortcut keys, and it looks similar to this. So he made his own little keyboard, and I was like, I had to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got kind of got into the hobby a little bit deeper. I mean, I always loved looking at photos of mechanical keyboards because they're all nice and colorful and stuff. As you'll see in the presentation, they're wonderful. But um, as soon as I made my own, I was like, why isn't anybody else doing this? I had to tell everybody. So uh, I, I really wanted to present about mechanical keyboards. And uh, I'll start with an overview because it turns out there might be one of you that don't know about mechanical keyboards, that guy in the back right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to go over things like uh, switches, layouts, costs, the keycaps, my uh, personal project and custom keyboards and the communities available for custom keyboards. Um, and it's just an intro to the hobby of mechanical keyboards. I call it a hobby, it's more of a life. <laughs> uh, so as we move on, the first thing I want to talk about are switches. Um, switches are probably the thing that make mechanical keyboard mechanical. Uh, I don't think there's anything else on the keyboard that can make it mechanical besides the plug. And even then, it's, it's what makes a mechanical keyboard a mechanical keyboard. A switch is like super basic, and uh, I, I can't stop touching this thing. Can, uh, can you pass that around? Is it fragile? No, it's mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that one's fragile, but this one isn't so much. So I will pass this one around. Start with uh, you. Me. Yeah, and then pass it to that guy. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's start with switches. Um, so there's a lot of variety of switches. The first one I'm going to talk about are uh, membrane and scissor. These are the ones you see on laptops mostly. Uh, these are also the cheaper uh, keyboards that you get when you buy like a Dell keyboard with your computer, or you you're like, I just need a Logitech or Logical keyboard that's really cheap, like 2,000 yen. I want to buy it now. I'm just going to go to the local store and buy one. This is what you get, basically. So you, this is the membrane technology. Um, in, in short. You take these keys and we push down, you're pushing down this little rubber uh, thing down into this membrane. Uh, so this is four uh, pieces, the bottom plate, the uh, kind of PCB type thing that just uh, says I've pressed a key. And then this is the rubber membrane and then the, the key caps themselves. And this is similar idea. So these are probably inside or these are probably mounted to this plate using this scissor uh, technology. MacBooks have this, the ThinkPad has it, I think. <laughs> most keyboards, uh, most laptop keyboards have this. See, so as you push down, this membrane collapses, and then this bottom part up here, this little black bit, uh, this little black bit, sorry. This little black bit gets pushed down into this area, and then that registers a keystroke. So that's how a key works, it's really basic. You have like electricity going into one side, you push down, and then it goes out on the opposite side, and the computer detects that. It says, hey, you, you press the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So what everybody knows are the Cherry MX switches, and these are the start of the mechanical key switches. Cherry's been around since like 1960s, I believe. What's Cherry, sir? What Cherry is a company. Oh, a company. Oh, yeah, Cherry's a, a company. They started in America, but moved to G uh, Germany. <coughs> um, they design switches mostly, switches and other mechanical components. Um, they're most famous for switches now. Uh, I used to have a cherry mouse when I, I'm at one of my previous jobs. So they developed things more than just keyboards and and uh, switches, not just peripherals for computers either. 
they do other things as well. Uh, but this is a general uh, a likeness of a cherry switch. So I'll start from the left. I'm going to walk over here. Hopefully that thing can hear me. Uh, so black, you know, it's super visible here. No, it's really hard to see on a computer screen as well. So uh, this, just imagine this, but in black, is that, that thing going down. And these are linear switches. So as you notice, as you push down the switch, this little, this thing is a metal or copper uh, like sheet. It just makes contact as you push down. As, it's, as it goes up, it pushes it away, so there's no contact. So you push down, it registers the key switch, the keystroke, and then that's how you, it knows that you made a key press. And there's a spring down here that pushes the key back up. This is a linear switch because as you push down, you don't feel anything, you just keep pushing until you see the, the keystroke on your screen. Uh, these are really popular with gamers, mostly because they put a really light spring and they, it's just a, a straight press and they can just tap really lightly to get the keystrokes that they need. Next up are the clicky switches. And this is what, what will annoy your girlfriends or wives mm -hmm. in a small apartment. This thing is really loud. So this is a blue, which isn't that loud. There are greens and reds, uh, similar to this. But what makes this clicky is that the separation of this part of the body versus the stem, which comes down and just kind of bangs down into the bottom of the switch. So every time you uh, hit a button, it makes a sound. So I'm going to pass around kind of a demonstration of a, a clicking switch. So I'm going to pass around a few switches. And so, just a second. Okay. I'll start with a clicky one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do it near the microphone. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. That's the clicky. And so uh, which color is that? That's the blue. Uh, this this switch itself is a blue. There's also a clicky green. Uh, but just imagine. And your girlfriend's gonna be really upset. So that's a, a clicky. Next up are the tactile switches, which don't have that separation of the bottom housing. They just have this little bump. So the blue ones have a bump too. So when you push down, you feel it. These don't have a bump. The linear ones don't have a bump. So you see the bump on this body and the bump here, and the the brown switches and the clear switches. The difference between the brown and the clear is just the weight of the spring. The difference between the red and the black is just the weight of the spring. So the black is going to be a little bit easier to, or a little bit harder to push down on. Actually, no. The red is going to be um, more, have greater force. You push down harder to actuate or make a keystroke on the red and the black. And then the blue. Uh, OK, so that blue, I replaced the spring on it. So that's probably 120 gram force. It's pretty strong. It's got some resistance. Like it's, it's pretty. I, I took a pen. I took apart a pen and then took the spray out of that cut in half a second. Oh, that's why. <laughs> that's like. So it, that one's pretty hard to press. Can I uh, ask a quick question? So I can feel like the clickiness and where it clicks. So where the moment it clicks, is that where it registers the keystroke, or is it all the way when you press all the way down? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, um, so the moment you hear that click should be the time the time in which it, it the, the keystroke is registered. But mm -hmm. there's an exception because. Um, with different switches come different spring weight weights, and that spring weight can modify the, when it act, actuates. <laughs> so, like a, a green, uh, you will actuate faster than the click. I think. Hard to explain. Sometimes you'll you'll see it fat, feel it, uh, earlier than that. But uh, so, these are tactile switches, and uh, I want you to feel the difference between these two. Tell me which one is stronger, the white or the green. So I swapped out. The, these are cherry clears. Uh, I swapped out the spring in one of them. Tell me which one do you feel? Uh, the white one seems a lot lighter. Okay. Pass it to him. I want to hear, hear his experience. Mm. Lighter to press? Yeah, which one's like stronger, more force, and which one's lighter? Well, this, the white one does feel lighter to me. Okay, yeah. So the, I took the blue spring second in that uh, green one. So what does that mean? That means I modified this, the, the cherry clear. The stock cherry clear is the one on your left side. Okay. And the stock cherry clear, that's the normal spring on the stock cherry clear. The one on the right is the one from the blue switch. So uh, you're going to feel a little bit heavier on that one. So that's to make sure that you can push down the quickiness. 
Yeah, I still do feel like a click, though. There's like a subtle kind of bump you feel when you press it down. So that bump, uh, so I'm going to be near the mic. That's another thing, too, about switches. That's a very different than that, that blue one, which is really, really loud. So these are more quiet. I like the tactile ones myself because they're quiet, and you still feel the bump. So the linear ones are quiet, but you won't feel the bump. The tactile ones, you have a little bit of force. Now there's a, this is a little switch tester I made. It's uh, custom switches made by a company in China. Uh, but these are extremely popular, they're called Zilio switches. Uh, and the different weights are written on here. So you can kind of feel them. I have a fourth one in the bag. Uh, as soon as I find it, I'll, uh, I'll stick it in that, that key tester. But these uh, key switch testers are really good if you want to get into the hobby and you want to experience a switch without buying like 50 of them. Like, I have a whole bag here of a uh, certain type of switch I really like. But if you want to get in the hobby, a key switch tester is really good. You can just try out which switch you like and then finally uh, decide one. So that's what uh, the switches, switches are awesome. So Cherry MX switches are, are the brand when people think about mechanical keyboards mostly. Um, there are a lot of uh, imitations, uh, but imitation is not bad. The, for example, those Yulio switches right there are, are well revered, the switches that he's holding in his hand, are revered as some of the best switches you can buy for a mechanical keyboard. Uh, and those are usually for custom keyboards though uh, there are some companies now offering them on their keyboards. But they feel really smooth, and they still have that tactile bump. So they feel like a cherry clear, but sometimes in between a brown and the clear. So those are really nice. So if you are interested in trying different, uh, different types of switches, then definitely get a switch tester, and then try them out. So per switch with a switch tester is going to be more expensive than buying a bunch of switches. So you have to kind of weigh that, like, yeah, I paid ten dollars for those four switches when in reality each switch is probably about seventy five cents. Mm -hmm. So I paid two fifty for each switch versus seventy five cents. Yeah, so for a full keyboard you're going over a hundred bucks. Uh yeah, for a hundred four key keyboard you might get up to a hundred bucks. But you can depending on the type of switch, uh if you buy them in bulk you get them cheaper, obviously. Okay. So a hundred and four keys is almost bulk. In reality bulk is four thousand keys, but you're not mm -hmm. a company. Do you build your keyboards? Do you like to include the number pad or no number pad? Uh, so that's a so so that's I'll, I'll introduce a thing later actually about that uh, the reason behind uh, my project. N next switch up is uh, Topra, Topre, Topre, Topre. It's this is actually a company uh, in Japan called Tokyo Press, and they are the key switch of the Hacky Hacking Keyboard, Happy Hacking Keyboard. Have you heard of this one? I'm pr it's pretty famous, actually, within mechanical keyboard circles. Happy Hacking Keyboard is, if you go to Vic Camera or one of the other, other electrical, electronic stores in Japan, and you go to the CoQ keyboard section, <laughs> you'll find a hacky, ha Happy Hacking Keyboard or a Real Force Keyboard, and you'll see this switch. This switch will be on there. Now, this is basically a rubber dome, as I mentioned in the first one, the ones you see on the cheaper ones. But what makes this different? is that this dome here is a really stiff dome and it has an extra spring. So this conical ring, this spring here, uh, is really good at pushing the keyboard right back up. And it feels really good. It's really tactile and the, the rubber membrane here gives you that tactile feeling. So uh, an example of a key, key uh, stroke would be pushing down and then you, you push down on the spring to apply the force. And then this part of the the housing? No. What is it? The the pressure plate here? The pusher? Pressure? Pranja? This thing. Plunja. Pranja. That's what it is. Plunger. <laughs> the plunger pushes down on the membrane and then pushes this into the the PCB to make contact. And that's how a key switches the register. Very that, similar to the first one. Is that what they use in the sync pads? That is Pretty good feeling whenever, even, even though they, they're very small, like uh, they tend to have a good response to uh, like spring back to. Uh, uh, that's actually a membrane. That's membrane. the first one I mentioned. Okay, so it's actually a membrane. Yeah. So what's uh, special about the ThinkPad keyboard then? The ThinkPad keyboards, I think it's just the. I don't know. There's something about them though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. different. I think the spring might be a little bit harder. Okay. So when you push down, you get more tactile bump. 
or the rubber might be st more stiff or something. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I like typing on this, this keyboard here, but I prefer mechanical over, over this one. Um, mostly because this keyboard is too condensed and I'm not a big fan of the hyper condensed keyboards. Uh, I, like, I like room. So uh, th this one's really, really popular. Uh, a lot of people will just equate this to membranes or rubber domes, and, but it, it, this is a totally different experience. And then buckling spring, everybody knows this. Mm -hmm. So back in the 80s and uh, the 70s and the early 90s, you saw this keyboard. This is on every single IBM. Uh, this is how it works. It is a lot like a rubber dome or a membrane keyboard, but when you push down on the keycap, it keeps pushing until the spring buckles, <laughs> causing that, uh, that feeling you get when you press down and that sound, that like pinging sound is from the spring. And then as you push down, it pushes a contact into the, the membrane underneath. So it's a lot like a rubber dome. Depending on, there are two types. There's a capacitive one, which has the capacitive, um, the capacitive foot, I'm going to call it. Uh, I don't know, I don't remember the word right now. <coughs> so it has the, the capacitive part that touches down on the PCB, or it has a rubber membrane that pushes down. There's two types. Uh, and this, this one is the classic. People, uh, the people in the hobby will buy these for a hundred, two hundred dollars. Uh, in Japan, you can find uh, really good ones, probably at Dinden Town or Akihabara. Um, so go to Osaka every once in a while. It's nice there. And next, I'll talk about layouts. So layouts are important because once you've chosen the type of switch you want, once you've gone through the tester and touched the ones that you want, uh, you need to figure out how you want to use the keyboard. So there's a lot of people who like this, uh, like a really condensed one, as I mentioned, and other people like a larger one. So I'll start with this one. This is a full size, a regular full size keyboard. This is the code keyboard. Jeff Atwood and this other guy, Wayman Kuang. Uh, Wayman Kuang runs WASD keyboards, so he's pretty popular. Um, I don't remember if he lives in the U.S. or not. Jeff Atwood, he, he's famous for making a lot of uh, coding blogs. He probably read a, a lot of them. He called this one the Code Keyboard based off of a book by Charles Petzold called Co Code. Love that book. Recommend it to everybody. Read that book, Code. So everybody knows a full-size keyboard layout. You get this with just about any keyboard you buy at the... You can go to the supermarket and buy a keyboard sometimes. Uh, probably can be me. Buy a keyboard. <laughs> this is what you'll get. Oop. Next up is a 10 keyless model. This is a Mistel. This one's a sleeker one. There's uh, another one I really like uh, looking at. I haven't used it very much. Um, this is a Barocco, but this is a Mistel. There's other ones like Razer keyboard. Uh, most gaming keyboards are offering 10 keyless now, and that pad is missing. The reason for that is because you want to use your mouse in this area. Uh, you want less space between your hands or something. I'm a big fan of keeping my hands wide but it's not ergonomically correct. So keeping your hands close together, straight, wrist straight, that sort of thing is good. So you keep your mouse in this area and your, your left hand on that keyboard. And that's what these keyboards are really good for. Uh, most people just like the compact nature of the keyboard. Gives them a little extra uh, space. And a lot of people don't use the number pad. So this is, this is a, a good fit for people who just want to save a little desk space. Next is the 60%. So, this is where you start, have to start pressing keys like this function key in order to get the F11 keys or press this PN key to get different layers. Um, so you hold down this function key and then you'll press the other one. So if you've ever had a laptop and you need to switch monitors or something or adjust volume, even a regular keyboard nowadays has a volume select where you'd hold down a function and then you'd hit a page up down for volume up or down or something. That's what these keyboards are like. Uh, you can experience what a layer is like by hitting caps lock on your keyboard and your keys go from lowercase to uppercase. That's what a layer is, basically. So, or if you hit the, the num lock key on your number pad, you go from the arrows from like uh, 8, 2, 4, and 6, uh, those are the arrow keys, uh, to the uh, 8, 2, 4, and 6, the numbers themselves. So when you're using a 60%, you have your keys, your hands on the keyboard, and you basically don't move them to do most tasks. And you'll just use your thumbs or your pinkies to modify layers or do things like up, down, left, right. Uh, and you just kind of hold this down and put your, uh, your finger down on this and then go up, down. It's kind of, 
not really ergonomic, and it's kind of a hard to get used to at times, especially if you want to use the arrow, because you have to use your right hand somewhere on the function and then use the arrows. It might get a little bit tough. It looks like more style over like yeah, people who, yeah, people who buy this typically... It looks sexy, for sure. Yeah, it looks really cool. Um, when you start with the 60%, you're basically saying, like, I'm fully committed to, to mechanical keyboards. I'm going as small as I can. I'm minimizing. The, the 10 keyless model is too many keys. I want to go for, like, less. That's what 60% is. It's 60 keys. That's what 60% means. Um, even though there's 104 keys on the full-size keyboard. <coughs> Next is the ortholinear. This is the layout where all the keys are just kind of spaced in even rows, even rows and columns. You might, uh, if you try it, you might get used to it and you might prefer this over other ones. A lot of people say this is more ergonomic, especially when the keyboards are split, but it really depends on the person. And if you notice the space key is really small, these are usually function keys down here. The space key, because a lot of people will choose one hand or the other to hit space when they're typing. Um, I, I use both hands usually, so I would like a wide key, a uh, space key. But if you just use one hand most of the time and then sometimes use your other hand, the smaller key, uh, space key might be good. It really depends on the person. Some people like it, some people don't. You, it really takes some getting used to because just imagine all of your alpha, uh, alphabet keys up here, and then these have to be other keys to select different layers, like your numbers and then your function keys and your arrows and the page up, page down, home, and that sort of thing. It gets really tiresome, but once you memorize it, you get used to it pretty quick. You don't have to move your hands as well much because the keys are so, there's so few keys, you can just move really quickly. Next are the ergonomic layouts. Do you remember those uh, Microsoft Natural Keyboards? Yeah. Th those are what people will typically think of ergonomic. Well, people went a little bit differently. And while the keys, the hands are kind of spaced inward for this one, some people like to say it's an outward. This is an ergodox. This is the Eurodox Easy, actually. Um, what makes this really cool and really e nice to use is that one is ortholinear, which some people don't like, some people do. Staggered layout is when the keys are kind of off. The ortholinear is the opposite version. Ortho. So when you put your hand there, you see your thumb can hit all these other keys to do different layers or hit enter or space. Enter is probably this key, most likely, because you're used to that one backspace up here. Um, but this is really nice because you can uh, tent it, you can make it go up, so you can put your hands almost, almost resting position to type, which is really comfortable. It really depends on the person. Um, some people like it, some people don't, and sometimes it's, you spend $100 to find out you don't like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so it really depends on the person. Uh, if you really want to try this, I suggest going with like a smaller, cheaper ergonomic layout first. Yeah, basically, you have to read um, how to type because the position is totally different. Yeah, for example, uh, this plain keyboard, people will have just keyboard maps in front of their keyboard for a little while because they have to learn where all the key mm -hmm. keys are. I mean, for the alphabet keys, you already know where they are. If you're writing a novel, this is probably not so bad. But if you're doing a lot of programming and you're using <laughs> those special characters, you probably don't want this. Uh, you probably want something like this, where you have the uh, open parentheses uh, here and here, and then the curly braces here and here if you're doing JavaScript or whatever language. Or if you're doing grain fuck, you just want like slashes and dots and whatever the hell it is. Yeah. So uh, you probably want them to easy access. These keys too, these keyboards are really nice because you can customize them. You can customize the layouts. If you don't like the QWERTY layout, you can change it to Dvorak or Colomac or a dozen other different types of layouts. Next is another version of the ergonomic one. This is the ultimate hacking keyboard. <laughs> this is really cool because you can uh, put them together. You can take this bit out, take this bit out, stick them together, and you have a staggered keyboard, about a 60% size keyboard. And if you want to space it out, you can just separate them. And this cable connects the two so that you can. That's an awesome one. Yeah, and then you can have a trackball if you want, the IBM trackpad type, type ball there. And then a couple extra keys, including space for modifi modifiers or function keys. These are really, really cool. Uh, but these are for more extreme people. <laughs> these are for people that are pretty experienced with keyboards, or they just they just want to look cool. This is kind of cool, right? Mm -hmm. Next up for the 96 and the 40 percent. 
So the 96% layout is just basically just take a few keys away from the full-size layout and just cram them together to make them a keyboard as small as possible. A lot of people like this one over the 10 keyless version because you compacted your keyboard to as small as you can because you removed all the spacers and sides and home row and uh, the home end page up page down have been moved uh, because you use them less, but you still use the number pads, so you still have it there. And the next up is this 40%. Uh, it's similar to the plank that was earlier, but this is a little bit different. This is from this is a, a Chinese model, whereas the plank is from Europe. I don't remember where it originated. Uh, Gcap forms probably, um, and this is a competitor to the plank. This, this is different because they they've made their the plank is usually flat on the desk. This one has its own case, so it's kind of curved a bit, um, or not curved. It's just it's just angled, so you can type a little bit better. It also depends on the person. Some people like the plank over the, the mini NUI. But that's a 40%. So that, that ortholinear keyboard, the plank that you uh, saw earlier, this one, this is like, OK, I'm minimizing everything on my desk. Just removing as many keys as possible from my keyboard, because apparently this keyboard was too big. So we're <laughs> moving down to the, the 40%. And uh, that's what these are about. These are just different layouts. And then you just get super crazy and you want to remove as many keys as you can, you get this. <laughs> you get the Gherkin keyboard. So this one is uh, a Gherkin. This one is just basically, this is just as minimal as possible. You have 30 keys on this keyboard. You have your alphabet key keys, which is 26, and then you have four extra keys. And from that you do different layers. So you can, so with the, the firmware on one of these, you can double tap one function key to get a different layer. You can hold down the function key to get a different layer. You can double tap and hold down another function key to get a third layer. You can have, I don't know, 8,000 layers on this thing. It's pretty crazy. Uh, but some people, this is, as they call it, a meme board. Because yeah. like, this is just going crazy. And then these are kind of, these are really cool because uh, one, one key is pretty good for doing things like locking a computer or you know, writing, writing copy and pasta on forums, that sort of thing. <laughs> you know, for Navy SEALs and stuff. Uh, next up, it just I want to talk about costs. And I want to start out with this. This is a high-end keyboard. This is the, the Norbauer. This is a $384 key dollar keyboard, 10, 10 keyless version. The cool thing about this, or the uncool thing about this, is that you don't get a keyboard with this. You just get a case. You, you, take, you take out your, you buy a real force keyboard, the, which is made in Japan. You take out the real force keyboard, and you stick it inside of this thing. This is a machined aluminum uh, case. There's different options, like you can select uh, hardened anodized uh, silver or green or black or just different versions. This company calls themselves the Nerd Atelier <laughs> because they offer up this uh, like one-off type uh, keyboard housing. It's not even a keyboard. You buy this thing, it's just a kit. <laughs> so, sorry, what's the Real Force keyboard again? The Real Force keyboard is the Topre key switches. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the Real Force is similar to it's just a just a different switch. So what are you getting with this? You're just getting that powder case only? Yeah, and then no, you can no buttons. No no keycaps, no PCB. It just comes with the <coughs> the kit. And then you take a picture and post it to Reddit and then everybody <laughs> gives you upvotes. Because right. you spent four hundred dollars on the thing, holy crap. <laughs> um, that's just one example of high end. This is just this is very custom, it's unique. Um, it's basically one of a kind type thing. You and ten other people would buy this thing. It's pretty. It's pretty unique. So some people really like it. Also, it's heavy, nice and heavy. Sits well on your desk. That's why people like that sort of thing. Uh, but I, I would not pay that much money. <laughs> Next is the middle to high end, and this is the happy hacking keyboard I talked about earlier with the Topre Topre key switches. Um, you see two prices here, but that's one like the net price, and then. I don't know if it's about how you cut you, cut, cut glues. I don't know. Huh? There's two different prices here. Anyway, so just pick the higher one. And just assume you're going to pay that price for this type of keyboard. This is a really nice keyboard. Uh, this is, uses the Topre switches uh, I mentioned earlier. But people love this keyboard. It's a, it's a pretty small, decent layout. The function keys are available on either side. It's really easy to reach and, and such. This is the US ANSI layout uh, versus the JP ISO. So it's a little bit different. So could you get that 
with like the other like the 104 key layouts, layouts and stuff? Do they offer like? No, this this is the only layout you get for the Happy Hacking keyboard. Uh, and then there's uh, different versions. This is the Professional 2. There's the there's like a signature version, I think, and a couple other ones. Um, but they're mostly all the same layout. It's a small layout. But when, when mechanical keyboard nerds see this on your desk, they're like, whoa, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, I can say th this is more high end for people that, that aren't into the hobby. Like, if you're really into the hobby, you're spending $400 for a case, case then. This is like kind of like low end, mid middle to low end for for you, but this is a really good keyboard. This is a really high quality keyboard. You'll find this in the CoQ keyboard section at, at the electronics retailer. This is another one. Uh, this is the mid range. I call it mid range. It's it's more of a low end type thing for people that like. I have that one. <laughs> okay, so uh, do you have what color switches do you have? Uh, well, do you know? Cherry reds. W what do they sound like when you you hear? You hear click? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You probably have clicky reds. Yeah, clicky reds. Yeah. yeah. So this sells for this price in in Japan from Amazon. Um, you can you'll find this also in the CoQ keyboard section too. So uh, if it's a mechanical keyboard, you'll find it in CoQ keyboard section. Do you know what I mean when I say CoQ keyboard section? Yeah. Yeah. At, at, at like the electronics, it's just a high end keyboard section. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you you walk in there, it's all the gaming keyboards, and it's all the ones with the different layouts and such. So, uh, what is that uh, place in Osaka next? It's not big y camera. Yodobashi. Yodobashi camera, that's what it is. Y Yodobashi camera has a big section of mechanical keyboards. And the B1. And naturally in the basement. Yeah, in the basement. And Corsair is a pretty good brand. You can get uh, pretty decent keyboards with this. This is a full size keyboard, it's a pretty good price. If you want to go low bottom barrel, for 2,600 yen, you can get a blue, clicky, uh, mechanical keyboard. I can't speak for the quality of this because it's 3,000 yen. <laughs> but if you wanted the blue switches, you could buy this cheaper than buying the blue switches. So buying the switches alone costs more than just buying this whole keyboard. Comes with a keycap holder. You can put your own <laughs> keycaps on there. Seriously, this is extremely low. It's crazy low. Next, I'm going to talk about the, the keycaps because this is where things get crazy. If you thought the price of keyboards were high, <laughs> keycaps will blow you away. This is so you have different profiles. Mm -hmm. The top one is the Cherry profile, crazy. an OEM profile. But you see on a normal keyboard, like uh, this little number pad, um, this uses the OEM uh, profile. This is what you'd find from eBay or something. Uh, really cheap. You'll find those at the normal store. This is what you'd find on most keyboards. Most mechanical keyboards. So, sorry, one, one quick question. So, for the OEM keyboard, it, it's kind of like, you know, kind of, kind of parallel or something. It go like this. Yeah. So, is, when is that is that indicative of like from the left side of the keyboard to the right side of the keyboard? Is that it's top keyboard? to bottom. So this is the space oh, bar basically, the and then R one would be the function keys at the top, the escape oh, okay. keys. So when the, the keyboard's tilted at an angle on your desk, you have that parabolic shape, and then it's dipped so you can start typing into it. I never even thought of that. So you can hit those other keys a little bit easier. So you have the OEM, which is what most keyboards have. Cherry, which is exclusive to Cherry. Uh, when I talk about these, most of these are made for only Cherry keycaps. Uh, there are there's adapters for Cherry keycaps to Real Force and or Topre key switches, but uh, those cost a bit of money. So I tack that onto the price as well. The XDA layout, DSA layout, and I'm saving the SA layout for last because this is probably... They're huge. Yeah, they're huge. <laughs> they're giant pieces of plastic on a the keyboard. They stick out. They're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I passed around the keys. Where'd they go? They're over there. Okay. <clears throat> so all the keycaps on those are SA row 3. Uh, these keycaps, because I'm a nerd and I bought VIM keycaps. <laughs> so uh, this is R1 SA profile. This is the R1. And then this is an R3 with a larger layout. So. And uh, these are double shot ABS. Uh, double shot means it uses two types of, uh, it's, it's shot with plastic twice. The reason that's good is because when you have 
uh, normal keyboard and it has the pad of the alphabet or whatever laid on top, so they sometimes wear over time. Yeah, and if your keyboards are painted, then you'll start wearing through, especially the back of the keyboards, which are usually just painted black over the over translucent plastic. Those will start wearing over time as you type on them. So what's good about double shot plastic is that as you wear on it over time, the logo still stays the same. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's really, really cool. So on the back of the keycap, you'll oh, see the white in the... Yeah, you can tell they double injected it. That's yeah. crazy. I think it's seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, those were usually made for things like cash registers. So the company that produced those, Signature Plastics, made typically made them for cash registers or industrial machinery. You'll be typing on them day after day after day for 10 years or so. So you need to make sure that you can still read the keycaps. And then hobbyists came in and noticed, hey, they're using the same key switches as my keyboard at home, <laughs> my mechanical keyboard. So they, they toss a, a, somebody tosses away a cash register and somebody puts those keys on the <laughs> keyboard and it's like, holy crap, these are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> those people are nuts. So uh, that's what the profiles are about. And this is where it becomes more expensive because the OEM obviously are gonna be the cheapest. SA, because the amount of plastic and how difficult it is to make, there's only two manufacturers in the world that can make this. Uh, one in China and one in, in America. Um, only two manufacturers that people trust. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there are clones and stuff. There's uh, Max Keys keyboard in China, which bought the old molds from Signature Plastics in America. So originally it was just Signature Plastics in America, and then they sold the old molds, and Max Key has them now. Max Keys has them now. There's also XDA and DSA layouts, which are a little bit different. Um, so these are the standard keys. You, you, you can find these for 1,000 yen on eBay. Last year, I bought the keys, a whole 104 key set, for 700 yen, oh. shipped, shipped. I didn't spend any extra money to sh for shipping. 700 yen the to my door. Yeah, these are OEM shaped. These are really basic. That's what's on this, this number pad and that's what's on that key macro pad back there. You have custom keys. These are the SA <laughs> keys I was talking about. Yeah, this is about $150 US for the full set. For the full set, this, yeah. this. That's without switches. No switches. These are just the keycaps. Oh so these are the keys, plus the number pad on the side, and it's about $150. Why is it so expensive? It's just uh, the lead time, because there's only two manufacturers in the world that can make this. It takes a really long time for them to get to you in a queue. There's a huge queue. All the manufacturers are still producing for cash registers. Oh. So cash registers, industrial machinery, uh, other types of things that need switches in general. They're, they're still producing for them. If there's so much demand, why don't they increase the capacity of production? Well, Signature Plastics is working on that, so oh. they're, they're trying to. But uh, hobbyists are only like slightly getting into the majority of the work. Before hobbyists barely even broke into the type of work oh. that they needed, so they didn't need to reach the capacity to, to do that. But they have a, a website, the company that produces these types of keycaps has a website called Pimp My Keyboard. <laughs> uh, Unfortunately, they raised the shipping price. So shipping to Japan is about $50 per ah. order. Previously, I think to get these keycaps, to get these keycaps, the ones I have on my keyboard at work, which are all the SA row three, the whole keyboard is kind of flat and uses this light, this uh, height. That was, it was $100 for those keycaps and it was $110 shipped with everything in. And I got a few extra keycaps because I, I needed to fill in some blanks because when you get a keyboard, sometimes the key size is a little bit different, so you need to make sure that you adjust for that. And because you adjust for that, you attack on more money, mm -hmm. and then you get the base kit or the Nord kit, which is the no Norway, Finnish, German <laughs> layouts, because you, you this is Spanish and other places, but you need the, the adjustments for your specific layouts. So you you net add an extra $30 because you're in Europe. And you have a number pad, and you want to keep the number pad matching the rest of your keyboard, so you add another $30 for that. And you have the base kit, which is just the alphanumerics. And then you choose the modifiers, which are the enter key, shift, the alt, and stuff. And you add a little extra money for that. And then, the, so this whole base kit is probably about $100. And then you have the number pad and your specific layout for country, and it's about $150 total for a single order. So that's nuts. but. The wait time for this is nine months. What? Nine Remember months? Remember I mentioned that there was a queue? Yeah. There was a queue for this. So the wait time is nine months, <laughs> nine to 10 months. So for example, this carbon essay layout, 
it said wait time is over. This post was made in uh, August of 2017. They made this. The wait is over at 2018. You can make a human in that time. <laughs> Yeah, people into the hobby buy these things. I bought them. I made a human in that time. <laughs> yeah, I have a baby. He's six months old, seven months old now. I have a baby. He was he was born after I bought the keycaps. <laughs> he was crawling by the time the keycaps came. So how much was that? It was one hundred fifty dollars for the keycaps. He asked the baby. Oh, the baby. <laughs> The keycaps are $150. I bought a Bones kit because I don't really like the orange so much, but I like the kind of like off-white and uh, dark gray color that was offered by another modifier kit. Uh, I should show you a photo later. It looks really cool. So I bought the Bones kit uh, with the modifiers. It's about $150 with everything shipped. And um, if you wanted to sell that same kit on the hobbyist market, if you wanted to resell it, it costs somebody $300 to buy it. Wow. The, the wait is so long, they're so hard to find. Uh, I think I'm one of 200 people in the world that have this specific set. Um, so uh, it takes a long time. I love them. I spend a lot of money on them. I should love them. <laughs> but I mean, this thing looks so cool. I kind of want this now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you go homeless, by mechanical <laughs> keyboards. <laughs> or your wife gets a second key. Yeah. <laughs> So n now things have to go through the, the finance committee at home. I can't buy things like this anymore. <laughs> uh, as soon as the kid arrives, all my finances are double checked. So <laughs> yeah, I can't do that anymore. Next up are these artisan keycaps. A single keycap is forty dollars. So you get a special wow. keycap. Wow. These are handmade. Hand so made? people, somebody will take the time to make a mold uh, or three D print a mold use their own like homemade injection system to mold it plastic and then paint it because they can't like quadruple shot this with oh, the that's four colors. The, the yeah the purple thing's the key. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. The purple thing's the key. That's the cousin key. These are not. These are just they make the, the other key look cool because this is purple and green and then this is oh. purple with green eyes. So it looks really cool. People who typically would buy one and put them on their escape key. I'm not going there. I spent too much money already. This is ridiculous. I have not I doesn't it just look weird? I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a fan of just kind of the white and off-white. I like plain. If it looks plain, nobody's going to steal it. So, <laughs> I'm American, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's why people like the, the artisans, because they're unique and they kind of pop and they show on their keyboard. Some people get a little bit overboard. Somebody made a whole keyboard of just artisan keys. So they have all these like fuzzy keys with different colors. And they have this like squirrel thingy, zombie squirrel, and then like, yeah, they go crazy. Yeah, they collect them all. <laughs> so in order to buy these keys, you have to go on a forum. You have to fill out an interest check, uh, like Google Docs, whatever, Google Forms uh, type thing. You'll go in, you'll fill out the interest check, and then there'll be a raffle. Whether or not you can actually buy the keys. And then, because of the manufacturer, the manufacturer is just a person in the same hobby. You can only make maybe like 30 keys. 200 people will sign up, 30 people get, can buy the keys. And then you'll spend $50 to buy the key. But you have a raffle to buy the key. It gets pretty crazy. This is like a super niche hobby that people just go crazy about. I think the guy spent so much money on these that he wasn't able to put key switches on his number pad over here. <laughs> uh, something's up with that. Uh, next up is custom keyboards. So, I mean, you have the key switches, which are important to mechanical keyboards, and you have the key caps, which are just like crazy, can get crazy, or it's just, you know, plain white is okay, if you're into that. And then custom keyboards, people go pretty crazy. So, the typical way of making your own custom keyboard is hand wiring. So, I brought this number pad in. This is hand-wired. You might not be able to see inside of it because I sanded the back of it because I scratched up the acrylic too much. So I laser cut acrylic and then I matched the keys to it and then I hand-wired it like this. Put a little microcontroller in the center, flash it with an open source firmware, and now I have a keyboard. I have a number pad. Because my keyboard at work is a 10 keyless model, I can have a number pad. And I put the number pad on the outside of the mouse. So I just use the mouse and then type on the number pad if I need it. Or sometimes I forget it's over there and I move it back and then, anyway. 
So I, I made a number pad this way. So I hand wired all the keys like this. So you make like a, a matrix of keys with diodes in between each key, each switch, all linked together. And then uh, current would run to the one side, you press this, and the key down, and then it runs to the other, and the, key, the microcontroller sends it. So you have to like solder it and everything? Yeah, so each one of these you have to solder. This guy is a 40% keyboard. Uh, this was featured on Hackaday, this keyboard, because he 3D printed the case, and it's all pink. Was this 3D printed? It was 3D printed. Anyway, you can read more about it here. The presentation will be as well on uh, HM outside, right? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I'll share it. So here's this. Uh, I should have tied, tied this. Hold on a second. So uh, on my way for, uh, from work to uh, this place, I kind of just ripped it from my desk because I use this one at work. Uh, so I didn't really put much thought into, like, hey, am I going to pass this around to everybody? Are they going to touch it? Oh, shit. This is terrible mess. Here you go. How long did it take you to, to like saw everything? And that one? That was quick. 30 minutes. Really? Wow. That, was bad. that was slow, actually, because I messed up a few times. It really doesn't take that long. So is this how your actual keyboard feels, too? Same uh, mine's a little bit different. I actually use a Razer uh, Black Widow at work. Okay. Um, so the keys are a little bit softer. They still have the tactile bone. Uh, I'm trying to make my own keyboard, which I'll uh, show in a bit. Uh, and it's going to be feeling a little bit different, more stiff. Uh, those are the Cherry MX clears on that one. These ones feel a bit mushy. Oh, right. Oh, no, those are the box ones. These are these switches. I brought some more switches in. They're a bit mushy. That's what these are on. What did you do about the, uh, <coughs> the acrylic? I guess there's acrylic wall or something? Did you like, order it or do you? No, I, I laser cut it at work, which is why there's so many mistakes on it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of mistakes on it. I should uh, cut it again, um, mostly because I, I cracked the acrylic. I didn't put enough spacing around the outside for the actual like keycaps, <laughs> uh, so the keycaps would crash into the corners where the screw the oh. screw holes are. Boy, that's a tough one. To yeah. Imagine before you put it together. So I, I cut it put it together and then realize the key caps are crashing into those corner bits. So I, I cracked some parts of the acrylic to try to open it up a bit and help. Um, Maybe shave the keys down. Yeah, just, yeah. Why would you ever do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Those are the cheap key caps. I could probably do that. But um, That's cool. This, I think this is the thing I'm, I'm most interested in, is like doing it like, do a DIY one. Hand wiring is a really easy way to do it. You could buy a plate online for like forty dollars, buy the switches for another thirty dollars, buy the cheapest ones for thirty dollars. So I've got a three D printer, so I was thinking like There's models available. You can actually get the SA keycaps, three D models, and print them all yourself. So but if you're printing ABS, you'll have to use acrylic to kind of uh, smooth them down. But if you're printing a PLA, you won't be able to do that. You'll have to sand them down, which is tedious. So uh, try try to go for ABS if you can. The downside to ABS is that the sunlight will affect it, mm -hmm. and they'll start yellowing over time. Also, you have to be really careful when you're smoothing it. Well, I'm in a code in a dark cave, so <laughs> there's no sun. <laughs> Um, so, you need the right wing, you have to follow a certain pattern? Yeah, you have to make sure that electricity goes in through one side and then through a diode on the other. That's typically the pattern. But the, the, the keys have to be in a certain order, the way you wire them? They have or to be in a row and a column type order. Yeah. Uh, so, that's why this keyboard is so easy to make and that's why the number pad is a little bit easier to make. Because all the rows and the columns are pretty evenly spaced. Uh, the number pad is slightly different because the bottom row has three keys, whereas the top row has four. And you'll notice that or the top row has four keys, and then each other key row has like uh, four, and then three, and then four, and then three on a number pad because you have the plus, the big plus, and then the enter. <coughs> it gets a little di bit difficult, so you have to hand wire it a little bit differently. And when you set it up in the microcontroller, you have to write the key map in there. So it gets a little bit different. But there is a specific way to ha uh, hand wire these and then get them going. But you have to have it so that the diode is facing one direction out, basically. Mm -hmm. Electricity goes in on one side, out the diode in the other. 
The reason for that is because if you press down multiple keys, uh, one key will get uh, register or something for the timing. If you hit this one and then this one really quickly, it hit them really quickly. It'll look like this key has been pressed without the diodes. Uh, there's more to it. I don't really want to go into that right now because there's a whole science behind uh, creating a matrix. Uh, as programmers, you probably already know how uh, you can probably look it up and understand it pretty quickly. Uh, the matrix of the keyboard. Next up is like, <laughs> some people go crazy. So those SA keycaps that I mentioned with the, the 10 monthly time, $150, this whole kit probably cost $600. Yeah. They, they ordered every single key you could. Every single key <laughs> from this run. This is the only one of its type in the world. So the Space Cadet SA keys were based on an old Space Cadet uh, layout or an old Space Cadet keyboard, which went to a special type of computer. And it was huge. The keyboard was huge and it had these little keys and it had these little uh, these uh, things on top, these little um, identifiers uh, on top. They were all special. Like you have the alpha or the lambda, or you had everything you needed. If you're doing math, you had this keyboard. And somebody went crazy. And they developed a PCB for it, and they just went overboard, put all the keys that they could. So some people go crazy with a custom keyboard. So uh, this one's an easy one. This was a hard one. And this one's pretty difficult, too. This is a Helix keyboard. This one's made in Japan. This is an ortholinear split keyboard. So you have them on different sides of your desk. You can split the keyboard. So you have half keyboard here, half keyboard there. This one, a uh, guy named Romley, not Romley, I forgot his name, or her name, I don't know, who, I don't, uh, anyway, there's a, a person in Japan who made these. The, they have a little OLED screen here with this cable that goes from one cable to the side to the other, and the USB at the back, and these keys that are kind of low profile. It, it looks really, really cool. Looks really, really cool. It's backlit, it has a, a LEDs on the bottom to light up the bottom. Yeah, that's all I have for custom keyboards for now. So some people go overboard. I should have put more pictures up here. That OLED thing reminds me. I remember a long time ago, this is probably before I came to Japan, there was like some experimental keyboard that had like mini I, OLED I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's the Optimus keyboard. It's yeah. by a French design company. Optimus keyboard, every single key had a different OLED display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This and is there a were, Moscow Russian one. Oh. <laughs> right, the Optimus keyboard, okay, yes. Why aren't, why aren't they making those? Like, that seems like they sell them. They still make it. Oh, I should have put that in here. I forgot about that. Thousand five hundred dollars. It's uh, it's crazy. Really? You can buy those OLED uh, switches too. Uh, they sell them on Mauser, but each each switch is about two hundred dollars. So building a hundred four key keyboard is probably going to cost you. Like, uh, you can, you can open a browser. Yeah, yeah. it would be crazy. There's got to be a way to buy like a hundred. Like little mini screens from like Alibaba or something. You <laughs> might be able to. <laughs> um, actually, Good I luck. remember I, I was following the blog of them. Um, oh, yeah. I think they actually built a factory for them. No kidding. Wow. Really? Yeah. So uh, they had like a Kickstarter and everything. Uh -huh. Like they had a 2008 or something? Before Kickstarter. Like, yeah, so like, uh, <laughs> like really long history, this thing. Wow. And, uh, so, so I remember the name of the company is Art Lebedev. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's, that's the keyboard. That, that's the one that they are selling. So the, 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 the round one. The, uh, this one? Yep. That's the one that they are selling right now. Wow. It has like a touch bar on top. Yeah, that looks uh, really cool. Where you can wow, go for the, so cool. the, the, the display. And uh, yeah, so they, I, I think they built a factory uh, for the keys because there was no other thing that built that. And uh, they, they, they shared like update progress and they were like, yeah, I had to get a factory. <laughs> <laughs> right. Takes a while longer, sorry. <laughs> yeah. but, like, I knew they sold like that little 10 key thing that's on the side. mechanical though? Uh, I don't know. They are mechanical. These are freaking. They have the they have the layouts for those on the on the, the homepage. They are all mechanical. Uh, awesome. I don't know how the the key switch is assembled though itself. Yeah, the, the, maximum, cool, though. the maximum, the maximum, the big one. I think it was two thousand five hundred dollars. It was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, and they switched to the smaller one because the, the like. The, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I remember That's that one. So cool, oh, the maximum. Yeah, it's so crazy cool. <laughs> So I want to talk about my personal projects. No. So. <laughs> Are you making the office? <laughs> okay, so uh, I have a numpad slash ortholinear keyboard. 
So the thing, I, I needed a numpad because I, I have a 10 keyless keyboard and then I bought another 10 keyless keyboard, the code keyboard, which I really like. Um, so I needed a number pad for it. Uh, and I wanted to try ortholinear and uh, I wanted a split layout. So I wanted them both sides of my, one of separated. And I wanted one set of C PCBs. So when I made the design and I ordered them from China, I wanted to order only five and then make two keyboards and a number pad. And that's it. I didn't want to make any more. I didn't really want to sell them. I just wanted a minimum amount possible to reduce waste. I don't want to toss them, toss them out or anything. Um, but you can't do everything right the first time, so keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the personal project. This is the keyboard I'm working on. As you can see, it's not a keyboard yet. <laughs> so uh, there's that, I'm sorry, so you, or, you ordered that from China, that you designed the PCB and like yeah. software or Yeah, 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 I designed the uh, PCB myself. Um, so hand wired, once you get the idea of how a hand wired keyboard works, once I made that number pad, I was like, yeah, I know how this works. And so I made a PCB. Uh, but I'll talk about the failures in a moment. Have you ever made one before or was it like a PCB? I made PCBs. I actually, those switches that the, are sitting on over there, the, the little purple ones, those are from Osh Park in, in the US. Those are testing the MX Cherry ones. And I had made PCBs for other things before, oh, little personal projects. What software do you use for the wireless? KiCad. Oh, the wired layout? Wait, what? Or the design of the... Uh, KiCad. KiCad oh. is the design oh. tool I used. It's an open source uh, mm -hmm. software for making PCBs and schematics. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an electrical engineer, mm -hmm. so I don't know how to actually, like... I don't know the math behind it. I don't know actually how to do it. I just kind of mm -hmm. did it, and then it's like, oh, it works. Uh. I, I took a reference design. I usually just take reference designs and then, and then try to modify them for what I want to use them for. Uh, for example, this one it uses the Atmega 32U4 microcontroller, and this is used the same microcontroller is used on that number pad. So I took the design from that number pad, the schematic from the number pad, replicated it on this board, and then kind of rearranged it for the board. That's how I did it. You're a programmer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I went to Stack Overflow. <laughs> uh, Google every time you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's how I did it. Um, this is basically how I do it. So I, I kind of mimicked one layout for another. That 1% keyboard, that one key keyboard, I looked back on that and I realized, hey, there's so many key things I didn't have to do. I don't have to do so much on here. So I, I put too much and uh, there were some issues, but my main goal for this was a number pad. And I wanted something that was simple. I don't have any backlight LEDs. I have one single LED for the number lock, basically. I guess I could drive more LEDs from that. Uh, but that requires more work I don't want to put in. Um, so this is the schematic. You can obviously read this really well, right? <laughs> you understand everything? So this blurry bit over here, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in a bit. Uh, still doesn't look very good. But the important bits are this. So one, you have the matrix layout. This basically looks like the handwired keyboard. So you have these diodes here and they all go through. And then these are, are the, the rows and those are the columns. So columns and then the rows. Like the handware layout. So all, all you have to do then now is just solder the keys and the diodes? Yeah, kind of. But yeah. there were some more things to this keyboard that made it a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that made it more difficult is that I wanted to be able to switch out the keys, the, the switches themselves. Like I wanted to put in a switch. Um, like one day I was like, well, I want to try the clear switches or something today. Today I want to try the clears. So I'm going to put in the clears today. And I'm going to work on that. No, nah, I don't really like them so much. I'm going to swap them out. So, so you, normally you can't do that, yeah? They can. Somehow, well, no, not normally. So most people that make PCBs make it for a specific switch or something, or um, other people make PCBs and put the sockets in there. There's like uh, ways to, there's a special company called KL. They make switches and mice components. And they, they make switches that are like uh, cherry variety. They make really, really good switches too. And they make these sockets for keyboards. But you have to have a special keyboard layout mm -hmm. footprint. So that's what I did for these. I wanted the, the switch to be on there. But I wanted the socket. As you notice, um, I'll pass a few of these around. Um, there's one, and then one over here, and then one over here. You notice that they're kind of mirrored? They look like butterflies almost. That's mm. because I can reverse them. I can turn the whole PCB around, stick the switch on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So I have the left-hand side and the right-hand side now. So that's how I designed the switch. Oh. 
so the, that's how the PCB is designed. So I can make it an ortholinear keyboard uh, that's reversible. So I, I, I just don't solder in the sockets uh, the first time. And uh, so I'll put them on the back here uh, for like a numpad layout, put them on the back here. Then I'll flip it over, and then later I'll just put them on the front where the IC is. And then. How are you going to solder the chip on here? The chip, the solder points are so tiny. And then my keys. Damn! Did you do, did you do that by hand? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think these guys are. Crazy. I did not yeah, I do the same. Don't don't judge me. Also, to touch it by the corners. Don't touch it right here because it's still flux and people are just. Wow. So I did that one by hand. That was hand soldered. And I used a really big soldering iron for that. <laughs> like something that's not supposed to be used for that. I have like a Hako at home, mm -hmm. FX eight 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 Hako, and the tip was way too large for what I was soldering it with. But I made the pads larger, uh, meaning that I could take those tiny little components. Touch those by the edge, please. Yeah, that one. That one is, yeah. Yeah. So I made the components, those little tiny, tiny components. I have little tweezers, stick them down, a little solder. Oh, I put a little solder first, and then put them down. Tweezers touch the far end of the pad. It melts the solder, sticks to the little tiny component, and then I can let go and put the other solder on the other side. But I made the pads really large for the tiny little component that sits between the pad. Pad here, pad here, tiny little component. So the solder just kind of rolls into it. And that's uh, how I made the most things, except for the microcontroller. The microcontroller is actually easier to solder than the diodes. So, um, and that's because I can just kind of lay solder across the microcontroller and then kind of scoop it out. So it makes it kind of straight. But, uh, the solder job on that is not very good because uh, I messed up, and I will talk about more, more about that later. But the, the biggest thing is that once you have the matrix layout done, thanks, thanks. once you have the matrix layout done, the hardest part is the microcontroller, and then figuring out what all of this stuff means, which I really don't know. So I, I just went online and found some reference diagrams, and then uh, stole their code, basically. <laughs> Uh, this is what the number pad looks like in, in the, a Gerber viewer. So I have the microcontroller up here. Wait, hold on. Yeah, that's that one. Uh, I have the microcontroller up here, and then the, the switches. This is the, the, the butterfly thing I was talking about. So you can reverse or flip the PCB over. So you solder on one side and solder on the other side if you have the hot, sw hot swappable switches. Programming it was a beast. Uh, hmm. It's really hard to see. Do you know what a bus pirate is? Does anybody know what a bus pirate is? So whenever you want to like look at a protocol or a microcontroller and you try to figure out what it does, you have to use something else like a logic analyzer to be able to see what it what it's doing. You have to see the ones and zeros basically. So you have to hook up something like a bus pirate to do it. So the way that this microcontroller is made, it comes from the factory with a bootloader. So I can I should normally be able to go in and then program it with a USB. But uh, I made it wrong, made the whole thing wrong. And then I put a voltage regulator in there for 3.3 volts when it needed five. Mm -hmm. It was under voltage and I didn't get enough uh, in. So it, w it wouldn't start basically. So I had to solder in directly into the, these little tiny pins, little leads so that I could get the bus pirate in connected and then program it that way. And I was like, yeah, it's programming. <laughs> and then I plug it into USB and it wouldn't work. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to talk about the mistakes now. So I have a few things. I have a few mistakes. I have oversized and undersized footprints. For example, the oversized fo the footprints are what uh, you see on the, the PCB, the pads. When you solder into something into the PCB, those are the pa pads or the footprints. So they were either oversized or undersized or wrong. They just didn't match. Like for example, my because I wanted the keyboard split and I want them connected, I needed to put like a an audio jack to connect those two together. So the pads for the audio jack were just wrong. Like I ordered the wrong part number and I put the wrong uh, thing on because where I was getting the PCB, they were offering a coupon code if I ordered from their their parts store. So I go to the parts store, but they don't have the things I need in stock, so I just didn't order from them. But I still use their diagrams to make the PCB. And then later, uh, they didn't have the parts, and I completely 
<coughs> didn't think of it, and then I just ordered parts from somewhere else, and they just weren't the right sizes. Then I have traces going to unknown places. That's some mistakes. Like, you can see here there's like a tiny purple wire. Uh, you, you won't be able to see it actually. But there's a tiny purple wi wire here that it's called a budge wire. Because the way I made the footprint, it was like, it was like one, two, three, four, but it needed to go one and three. So it's really one, two, three, four. So I need to bring a wire from this corner to that corner instead of the same side. So I have a bunch of those on the board. And I needed to get rid of like, I needed more voltage, so I put a big red wire here to go from one side, from 3.3 uh, .3 volts to 5 or whatever. So I have a lot of bad things. Awkward switch positioning too. So like the switches, they just kind of go all over the place. And the small mounting holes, these are M2 size mounting holes when I really need like M2.6 or M3. And then, uh, because M2 are really, really hard to find. I went to Denden Town and I went to Akihabara and they're just really hard to find M2. And then uh, missing programming headers. So when I made the mistake of just assuming that USB would work the first time, I didn't put any programming headers, so I had to solder into the these little tiny little pads here. I had to solder wires into that <laughs> to get it to program. And it looks like it worked, right? It was programming, everything looked okay. You see things moving by, progress bar going. Yeah. I plug in the USB, and then it worked. It would recognize it as a USB keyboard, but then uh, I left for a trip to Tokyo and came back, and then it d stopped working. <laughs> so this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Goodbye, keyboard. So uh, once I fix the mistakes with the other ones, then uh, hopefully it'll start working. And then I wouldn't have wasted anything, <laughs> except for one. So this is revision two. This is what I'm working on now. Uh, I kind of want to do it again, but I don't like waste, so I kind of don't want to do it again. But I'm still <laughs> thinking about it. So I put the M3 mounting holes. I haven't drawn the, the lines or whatever, the wires to each switch. And I put the microcontroller in and a different USB plug and a different crystal and the programming headers over here so you can program it if you need to. I might actually move that. Another thing was this reset switch. I have this little tiny reset switch but like where it was supposed to be soldered into was wrong. So I'm gonna draw on this back board. So a switch in a, a schematic looks like this. You have a switch in a schematic and you have a line and a line. And this goes one way and this goes another. You push on the switch, it, that's how the switch works. So uh, when I bought a switch, you have like a one and then a two and then a, a three and a four. Because so I was working for two marketplaces. The first switch looked like this and the second switch looked like this. So this is one and a two and a three and a four. <laughs> so I pushed down here and uh, one and four would work. But if I got the other switch, it would always be on, basically. So I had an always on switch, which just. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, so that's revision two. So. Um, Another project I want to do is a full-size key keyboard, a full-size PCB. I call it DIY Extreme. Like, when you're making your own PCB full-size, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. But it's expensive. It's, it, it's, it's ex expensive. So I put this in here. Why pay for, pay for something like a mechanical keyboard when it can cost double the price? <laughs> I can make it myself. So a full-size keyboard is one of my projects I want to work on. Another project I want to work on, oh, actually, I already started kind of working on the full-size keyboard, so this is the schematic for just the matrix layout, the key layout. So this is like, hmm, I'm holding a baby in one hand, moving switches in another, he's squirming, I'm like, okay, I have to stop now. And this, this, this project probably took six months of my time because I have a kid and it takes time to do this. So, like, it might... So my keyboards might have cost $100 at a time, but over like six months, if I'm just not going anywhere because I have a baby in my hand, then uh, you kind of save money. <laughs> uh, so a schematic for full-size keyboard, full-size keyboard is what I want to make. So you have the up and down arrow keys. I kind of made them look nice, but in reality, you don't need to make it look like that. Next project is a Bluetooth controller for a keyboard. I have a reference design from Texas Instruments, and I wanted to make a Bluetooth key. Uh, controller for a keyboard. A lot of people who do the hand-wired keyboard that you saw earlier have this microcontroller in the center, 
and I want to be able to just do a drop-in replacement and make your keyboard Bluetooth. So you don't have to run the USB cable. Mm -hmm. You just put in a battery that will last about a year or so, six mm -hmm. months, I think, actually. Six months was the estimate. So those people are buying microcontrollers and making their own hand-wired ones. I want to make the Bluetooth. This wouldn't work, obviously, for the big metal cases, but for the plastic ones, it'll definitely work. And uh, I kind of have this. This is like, I have a schematic already in place, uh, but this is when you're designing the keyboard. So when you're designing something in KiCad or whatever uh, software you're using to make a PCB, you have to click and drag components, and then you have to draw the wires between those components. So these are all the components for the Bluetooth controller. And then there's like two microcontrollers, and then two, uh, yeah, it's just crazy. This, the microcontroller for the, the Bluetooth thing, the Bluetooth keyboard or controller is going to be crazy. I might, I might use, use a different controller to think, but yeah, so these are like, there's like 50 different things on here. It's, it's crazy, and it goes two-sided. Like this was two-sided, but most of the components were on one side. The opposite side was, was just going to have the sockets. This is going extreme. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about, and I'm slowly wrapping up. I know you guys are bored. <laughs> communities. So I want to talk about communities of uh, mechanical keyboards. So if you want to look up mechanical keyboards, where should you go? Geek Hack is the most serious discussion place on the internet for keyboards. Um, I, did, I forgot I actually had this in there, but there was some drama a while back for, on Geek Hack, maybe like seven years ago or so, where they split off into Desk Authority. Just ignore that. Geek Hack is a pretty serious community. If you want something technical, uh, you go to the old like PHP, PHP BB uh, forums, and then you, you find like really technical people in the keyboard community. So if you have like, some off the wall request or you have some off the wall idea, that's, uh, Geek Hack has probably already thought of it. You could probably <coughs> get advice and everything you need on there. Desk Authority also is a serious community. Um, and they have a really great wiki. So they'll teach you all you need to know about a keyboard. It's a really, really good wiki. So Desk, a Desk Authority wiki. I had to mention Reddit. But Reddit is mostly just cool photos. Like, <laughs> uh, I'll show you. Sorry. Uh, so, what was it? I typed that a lot. Uh, okay, so, uh, I'll keep it on old Reddit. So, most of the photos, you it see, it's just photos. <laughs> You'll see people with advice and just memes and stuff. <laughs> uh, this is what Reddit's mostly about, but they have a really cool wiki. Their wiki is really, really good. It's open and you can use it. Um, I would say their wiki is not as good as Desk Authority's wiki, but you should uh, check it out anyway. There's a lot of reviews and stuff on here. And people will post these keyboards where like, this looks really cool, I want that. And then you realize there's a 10 month lead time on the keys. And then the, the case itself is homemade and then, yeah. And then just, just pictures, just really just pictures. So if you want to look at cool keyboards, Reddit. If you want a, like a serious community with uh, uh, like discussion on keyboards and how they, how you can make your own, ECAC. Desk Authority as well. <coughs> Two communities that do really really cool, cool things. And then I have to mention OLKB. They're the the creators of something called the the QMK firmware, which is an open source firmware for keyboards, which you can just buy a microcontroller, hand wire your own key, and make a number pad or something. That's what I did with that one. I used QMK. An OL keyboard stands for ortholinear keyboard. Does that use like Arduino or something like that? Yeah, you could use an Arduino Pro or a Teensy or um, an Atmega, oh. just the Atmega one, or there's a few other microcontrollers too. Just, uh, just check out OLKB or QMK firmware. Check out the Desk Authority Wiki. They will actually show you how to make a keyboard. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend, like if you were going to make a custom keyboard, would you recommend going the PCB route? Or like a wire is just, hmm. you know, I don't know if easier is the right word, but. What type of custom? So I, you. I have no idea. Okay. Still, I'm, now I'm even like more like, oh god, there's so many options. There are so, there's, so there's something called the dactyl. I'm actually going to bring that up. So uh, I, I hope you don't mind me going incognito mode so often. 
Uh, there's something called a dactyl keyboard, which is like one of those custom keyboards that everybody just makes. Um, it's this is the oh, I keep clicking that. Why do I keep clicking that? Okay, this is the keyboard layout. So you see it. It's very ergonomic. It's split. Uh, you can rest your hands on there, and it's kind of curved. Um, I once saw a curve that was over. It wasn't very ergonomical, but it was good for some people. And then this one goes inward, so you can hit almost any key with uh, a short. I just want like a, I want like a, like a Zen pose where I can just put it. <laughs> yeah, tented, you can do that. There's a guy who put a keyboard mounted on his uh, la his uh, chair. So he just lowered his arms and just started typing. <laughs> The keyboards on the trousers. You can put a keyword about anywhere. So the reason why I mentioned this keyboard is because this one you want to hand wire. You want a case and then you want a hand wire. Yeah. You can get a flexible PCB, but that costs a lot of money. Uh, so this one you want to hand wire. If you want to make your own keyboard, hand wire is the way to go. So if you're thinking about this one, definitely hand wire. If you want a number pad or you want the ortholinear layout, I recommend buying a PCB. Uh, I don't exactly recommend making your own because it's really annoying and I've made yeah, one. It, and like it. it takes a lot of iterations. Yeah, this, this it's, is... It's probably fun. Though, yeah, it's fun sometimes <laughs> until you get them and you realize you programmed it and it's like, why isn't it working? And you spend like hours figuring out why it doesn't work. And you have to desolder things, and you think like, maybe it's that it it gets tedious. So um, yeah, I wanted to just mention these communities. So if you want to make your own keyboard, uh, check out Dust Authority Wiki, uh, Geek Hack to talk about it, and then mechanical keyboards to look at them. So so learn, talk, look, <laughs> and then program. And the last thing I just want to talk about communities in Japan. Uh, so Tokyo Mechanical Keyboard just had their fourth meetup recently. Um, and Twitter has a lot of active users. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of Japanese people that love custom keyboards. Uh, there's a surprising amount. I don't meet many Japanese that are into like PCs in general. Really? They don't come out. Yeah. They, 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 they don't come out. Maybe because I'm more of a gamer or something like that. Probably. The keyboards that they're probably interested in are those like Corsair or Razer type keyboards mm -hmm. or the Logic Cool ones. They're probably not interested in creating their own keyboards. Right. I, I, I don't think I've even, outside of like a few exceptions, I don't normally run into people who, Japanese people, that like even build their own PCs or anything like that. So uh, yeah, I mean. It's just being my small bubble. Yeah. Yeah. You get out and get out. That's kind of interesting, but yeah, it's, it's pretty like, like people those, on the ground. Those people are like, like talking to foreigners is a high social skill acquired <laughs> and acquired taste in Japan. Yeah. So. If you see a happy hacking keyboard on somebody's desk in they, Japan, yeah, they're then they're, they're probably they're into keyboards. Right. Uh, or they just think it's a good keyboard for programming. Like I think most of the Japanese keyboard, uh, the keyboard community, they have a happy hacking keyboard. It's made in Japan, it's a really nice keyboard, everybody loves it. And it's uh, cheaper in Japan than it is elsewhere. If you were to go back to like your, your home con country and buy the Happy Hacking keyboard, you'd probably pay almost, well, maybe like 30% more. It's pretty, uh, people like them too. It's a really good keyboard. You get something for your export business. Yeah, I was actually just thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do the mechanical keyboards. The guy who made the Helix keyboard with the OLED screens on the side, he's, he's selling them overseas now. He's got a group buy going. I mentioned the SA keycaps where people had to wait 10 months. They do something called a group buy. So they get a bunch of people together. They, you hand somebody, one person, your money and hope in 10 months you get your product. <laughs> so there's some risk involved where you, you have to pay for something up front. Because the lead time is 10 months, that means the factory has to make a bunch at the same time. And if you want to reserve that spot in your queue, you have to pay them a lot of money. So uh, you get a group buy together, that number becomes smaller. A bunch of people put their money in, that number t uh, becomes smaller because now you can make 500 sets in that small queue versus one set, which would cost you maybe $10,000 because you bought that queue, that, that line, that queue, uh, that spot in the queue. But in Japan, uh, a lot of key keyboard users, mechanical keyboard people, uh, they're active on Twitter and they're active, they're, I think, I don't remember the exact number, uh, but the last Tokyo mechanical keyboard meetup, actually, they filled up the entire room. They had everybody they needed. 
Also, I'm sorry about the yellowness of the screen. I just realized at the end of my presentation, the there's a yellow color. hue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Flux on yeah I have flux on. <laughs> uh, flux is set to the max setting. Uh, so. What does it look like without? Without flux? Oh god, it's gonna hurt your eyes. Ah oh, man. So let's disable flux. Sorry, I just at the end of my set uh, presentation too. So I'll just do it for an hour. Oh, much better. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <Too bright. laughs> I thought the projector was just crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was looking at the projector and I was like, why is it so yellow? <laughs> <laughs> the wall must be dirty. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> to start again now. Okay. Now, let's start over. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Um, <laughs> yes, we have probably another five minutes before we have to clean up the room, so... Oh, crap, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Any remaining questions? Any two or three questions like so? Why do you think like this mechanical keyboard thing is kind of taken off? I mean, it's the been last popular. Like, five years or so. Five years. Like it's cheaper switches, maybe. Mm, is it it's just like an economical thing. Yeah. Also, they just look cooler. Like now that you can yeah, see these in like real yeah, color. Yeah. Yeah. Typing, like, I feel like nobody cared about keyboards like ten years ago. Like maybe it's really small community. But Do you remember the DOS keyboard when that was released about 10, 15 years ago? People made a big fuss yeah. over the DOS keyboard. Yeah. Because the DOS keyboard had no uh, pads printed on them. They were just blank and everybody... Oh, uh, yeah, I do remember. That was a mechanical keyboard. That was one of the first ones. In my time, when I, like 10 years ago, when I was into keyboards, the IBM keyboards were like the things yeah. that were handed around. Like yeah, on yeah. eBay, you could go and get the... the but that was like a retro thing. Right? No, 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 it was like the, 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 the keyboard switches were like, yeah, I have to get this. Uh, okay. Yeah. Really cool. And... Uh, uh, also, Cherry started ramping up yeah. their production. Yeah. So, so Cherry, yeah. yeah, Cherry ramped up the production. They were able to sell the manufacturers like Logitech, Razer. Razer got a Chinese company, Kale, to make their switches for the Razer keyboards. Um, just gaming companies in general started increasing, so they wanted to make their own um, hardware for that to compete. It's interesting. I think it's cool. I like, I like seeing custom stuff. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. I love these keys. Which ones? The, the the Mac ones? The, the new Mac ones. Those are scissor membrane. The, the, the new ones? Oh, I don't know actually. I haven't tried them. The, 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 yeah, the these are not regular. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I love them. They are like my, my new, like, I cannot, I cannot go to mechanic, like. It's a light touch, right? This is awesome. Like, this is bad shooting thing crazy also. Yeah, it's a really light touch to use those. The disadvantage, I guess, oh. of loving mechanical keyboards is that yeah. whenever you have a laptop, you, yeah. Yeah. you just Since can then never I get that mechanical keyboard. I don't know keyboard. about that. That one in particular is just weird. That Mac yeah, is just really a weird touch. Keyboard. Like, the ThinkPad is, is nice. Yeah. Oh, man, you can actually see these now. Now that it's not orange. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, like, seriously, like... It's pink. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm just used to flux. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. The whole whole presentation is orange. Can you show that black one with like the red uh, background again? Uh, I was just gonna buy one. one. I might just get that one because it's kind of cool. Black one with red background. There. Oh, this right one. There? Yeah. What was this one called? It's Corsair. Is that the plain one? Isn't there like RGB version? Uh, yeah. This this one actually is the RGB, is it not? This is backlit. Uh, red yeah. LED. This is red LED backlit. Yeah, also it's got N key rollover. Like typically with keyboards, because of the diodes and the way the microcontroller does the thing, it, you can only do six keys at a time. Like four mm -hmm. modifiers and then six regular alphabet keys. So 10 keys technically. But N key just means an unlimited number. Oh, okay, okay. So I don't know if you've ever experienced it playing games yeah. where you would Long move. Ago, you see, yeah. I, I experienced it with like just a couple of years ago because I was using a cheaper Logitech keyboard. Yeah. I experienced that. Uh, where I couldn't, I was trying to strafe, go forward, <laughs> jump, reload, and a couple other things at the same time, and just wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> All right.